Hello, and welcome back to stage three. I'd like to do a quick couple of announcements. Um, if you haven't yet visited the expo booth, totally recommend that you go ahead and do that. Uh, there's a lot of great things going on with our sponsors as well as community uh, organizations like actually the one that our speaker is involved with. Um, a quick <laughs> shout out to our sponsors, uh, Mondo, DB, Microsoft, Verizon, Salesforce, Amazon Information Security, eLearn Security, Intel, and Remediant. I think I'd be better at this by now, but I'm not. Um, our next <laughs> speaker is Tracy Martin talking about getting paid like a boss. Uh, Tracy's done all kinds of interesting security things that she hopefully will tell you a little bit about, including uh, running DefendCon. And if you don't know what that is, pop over, as I said, to the expo booth and find out all about it. I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy. We'll do Q and A at the end. All yours. Thank you. Hey folks, thanks for joining me. Um, for those of you who have heard me speak before, this is definitely a different topic than I'm used to presenting on. Um, one of the things I have talked to a lot of people coming into tech and even people who've been here a long time is that salary negotiations, salary offers, especially when you get to high tech can be really complicated. And sometimes, especially women aren't always given the tools to negotiate those offers with confidence and to understand the terminology that's presented. Because if you're like me and you grew up in a house world, in a house where women didn't talk about money, or maybe you just weren't exposed to that growing up like I wasn't, then this talk I think will be really helpful in hopefully getting your next job and getting paid like a boss. So let's start with our overview um, introduction. We're gonna talk some vocabulary words. There's a lot of vocabulary words in this. It's a little dry, but I'll try and keep it interesting. We're gonna actually look at different offers. Uh, I'm gonna look at a couple offers that are modeled on like some of the companies you're gonna see in the real world. The, I have hidden the names to protect the innocent, but if you do a little digging, you should be able to figure out which ones are which. Uh, then we're gonna go over some negotiating tips, and then at the end, I'll take questions, and hopefully this will be useful to you going forward. Uh, okay, so who who is this chick? Why am I listening to her? Why am I here? Um, like I said, my name's Tracy. I've got almost 20 years experience in tech, which is soul crushing when I say it out loud. Um, I've done both private and public sector. I worked for the government for a while. I did missile defense. I did counterintelligence. So if you see any of the um, theories running around about me being a spy, that's probably where that came from. Still not a spy. I know that's what a spy would say. We, we, run, we run into this circle a lot. I've worked for two of the FANG companies, um, Alphabet and now Amazon, and a host of other tech companies, uh, Microsoft, Adobe, Twitter. I also ran my own consultancy company for three years, uh, so I've been on the other side of pay negotiations and hiring. I'm the daughter of two stockbrokers, and the reason this is relevant is because while I was surrounded by all this financial um, sort of talk and financial literacy, a lot of it never percolated down to me because my family was extremely traditional and sometimes um, they just didn't really honestly think I'd ever have to deal with this. So I didn't learn about stocks and bonds and how to save for retirement until I was much older. Um, but I have successfully negotiated seven offers in tech in the last 15 or so years. You'll notice that the 20 years and the 15 years don't add up because five of it was in the military where I got paid nothing. So I don't really count that as uh, successfully negotiating an offer. Um, okay. So there's a lot to cover in this and there are a ton of words and a lot of math. You're not gonna get it all just in this talk. I've got a link at the very end to the slides. You're gonna wanna go back and rerun the numbers. It's just a lot to take in in 40 minutes. So that's okay if you miss something. I'm happy to take questions at the end, but it's okay. All right, Ooh, there we go. Okay, so your base salary. Everyone should be familiar with this. Your base salary is what you get paid on a bi-weekly, monthly, but what comes in your paycheck? It's guaranteed to you income unless you get fired. Um, there's no you know, sort of vesting period. There's nothing that you have to do to get this money. It's part of what they're going to pay you on a reliable schedule. Sign-on bonuses. Some of you may be lucky enough to negotiate an offer with a sign-on bonus. It's generally a one-time um, pr or prorated lump sum. So basically a company says, hey, we really, really want you, so we got, we're gonna pay you $20,000 to come over to our company. It's a one-time cash payment. Um, annual bonuses are usually a performance rated bonus. Uh, sometimes it's a flat sum, most often it's tied to your performance, and depending on the company, the formula can get 
a little wonky because some of them have things like, oh, well, half your bonus is based on your performance and half your bonus is based on the company performance. Your performance can be incredibly subjective to your manager um, and company performance is largely out of most people's control unless you're operating at a C-suite level and then you probably need an entirely different presentation than this one. Um, insurance, so this is your medical, your dental, your short-term disability, your long-term disability, your vision, all of the things that help you be healthy, stay healthy, uh, time off and vacations, pretty self-explanatory, but there's some different sort of schemes on how they do that. Um, retirement contributions and plans. I find that people overlook this one the most because people just kind of think, oh, it's retirement, it's a long way away, they have a 401k and psh, whatever, it's fine. Your retirement contributions can actually add up to thousands of dollars over the course of your employment. So it's really important to pay attention to your employer match, your employer, employer plan and how they administrate. All right. So now you have this offer in front of you and you have a sign on bonus. So what questions should you be asking about the sign on bonus? When am I going to get it? Most companies pay it up front, um, either on date of hire or 30 days post. But some companies make you wait a year, two years. I've even seen as long as five years to get your sign on bonus. Really important to understand how long you have to stay there to get that money and when it's coming in. Um, I've seen a lot of folks that come new to the industry that say, OK, I've got this sign on bonus that's you know $40,000. So I'm going to go buy a condo and I know I'm going to get my sign on bonus and that's cool. They don't realize maybe it doesn't come for six months. And now they've got this you know down payment over their heads that they can't pay anymore because they were anticipating a sign on bonus. When do I have to pay it back? Um, for those of you who know me, you'll know that I recently left a job after a pretty short tenure um, and I got a nice little letter from them saying, hey, you didn't make it your full year. Please pay us back 25 percent of our sign on bonus. Good to know. I did know that before I quit the job, but I have seen people surprised by this. Figure out how long you have to stay and if it's prorated. Which, and what that means is some companies are all or nothing it means if you don't stay a year, you pay the whole bonus back, no questions asked. Some companies, like my company, it's a prorated schedule, which means for every month you stay, you get to keep a certain percentage of it. So if you stay nine months, maybe you get to keep 75% of it. So that's really, really important to understand. Um, ask them what tax method they use. Depending on how your income is situated, this can make a big difference in how much of your sign-on bonus gets paid to Uncle Sam. Um, and that can affect what you actually take home in that check. There's two different methods for calculating um, bonus taxes. I'm not going to get into them here because that's a whole nother lecture. But basically, one is higher, one is lower. Figure out which one your company uses, and then you can better anticipate your sign-on bonus. Um, you, you notice that they have an annual bonus structure. Well, what's the schedule? Is it every year? Is it every quarter? Uh, is it tied to sales goals? Is it tied to something that I have control over that I don't have control over? People sometimes depend on their annual bonuses, not realizing that there can be things you have absolutely no control over that affect your bonus and that money is not guaranteed to you. This is the question I wish I'd asked when I joined my very first tech company. They said, well, your bonus is 15% of your pay. And I said, cool, I'm a pretty high performer. I do good work. I mean, obviously I'm gonna get at the top of the range. I mean, that's just an obvious. Well, it turns out the manager I worked for, kind of a jerk, um, because of the way the bonuses were divvied up, he knew that if he gave everyone lower than him a lower bonus, he could give himself and other managers a higher bonus. So it's really important to ask what the historical average for bonuses are in the group, because if you're in a group that gives historically low bonuses, you should know about that. All right. Insurance. This is super important and really often overlooked. What specific plans do you offer? Um, when I was younger and healthier, <laughs> I didn't really so much care about these things. Um, because I didn't really go to the doctor that much. It wasn't that important. Uh, last year, as some of you guys know, I had a bunch of health problems. I, uh, I paid a lot of medical bills. Knowing which plans are available and which doctors I can see is incredibly important to me now. You may not think it's important to you because maybe you are also young and healthy, but if you get pregnant, um, if you have a complication from a fall or an accident, suddenly your medical bills can look quite different. Um, if you're planning on becoming pregnant, if you happen to be trans, if you have mental health issues, you need to know if those things are covered by these plans because you don't want to be tied into a plan that doesn't fit your needs because that can be thousands of dollars out of pocket for you every single year. 
Um, also understand how they do the payments per person per period. So for example, uh, the last company I worked, it was, I think I paid like $30 or something like that for me. And then it was plus family. And that could be my husband and, you know, 25 children if I have. Um, my husband's plan is him. And then when you go to me, it adds some money. When you add one child, it adds some more money. When you add two children, it adds more money. And it keeps going up to like eight children. So that can really affect if you have a big family, understand how much your payment is going to be that you're paying in, um, in premiums each month. Time off. Less important to some people, as I get older, time off becomes very important to me. Um, how many days? How many days do you get? This is a pretty easy one. Um, what's really interesting now, um, for example, I used to work at Twitter. We had unlimited PTO. Great in theory. Uh, depends really heavily on your manager. My manager was awesome. I got to take advantage of it and have a really flexible PTO schedule. I've also worked at companies where I didn't have that option. And at the end of my tenure there, I didn't have any payback. I didn't have any, you know, time off sitting in a bank waiting to be paid out to me. It was just what it was. Um, ask if sick days are separate or if it's all lumped in together. Um, for those of you who may have medical conditions, this is really important because if you have to take only sick days for sick days and only paydays for paydays, then it can be a lot harder trying to manage your time. Do I get sick or do I go on vacation? Do I give up my vacation so that I can be sick? It just really is important to reflect on your lifestyle and figure out what that means to you. All right, uh, so what's the average days off per year taken? Well, okay, so this is hard to answer and a lot of companies don't know, but you can kind of get a feeling from your boss. So I asked when I joined and my boss said, you know, most people take two weeks off around Christmas and most people take two weeks off in the summer. This is important because it lets you know how your manager feels about taking time off because all the time off in the world isn't gonna help you if your manager won't let you take it. Um, ask about parental uh, leave, disability, sick leave. Uh, for example, for those of you who know um, about, I developed a heart condition two years ago. I was at Google. Our short-term disability and long-term disability paid 80% and 60% respectively of my pay, which is really, really good. Most people in the industry don't pay that high for short-term and long-term disability. But even so, 40% of my pay was a huge cut. Um, so understand that if you get sick, that you know may affect how you're able to continue to afford things, especially if you have medical bills. All right. Retirement contributions. This is my favorite because people overlook it. What is your retirement plan? Who manages it? And I know somebody out there is going, I don't care, Fidelity, uh, you know, whatever, pick a, pick a company, it doesn't really matter to me. But those different companies have different fee schedules and that can affect how much money you're actually saving versus how much you're paying a broker. What's the matching percentage? Uh, there are companies out there that pay 100% match up to the IRS limit. That can be $10,000 a year almost. Some companies only do a 4% match. I've seen some companies do a 1% match. Suddenly all of these like five, $10,000 things that you don't really think of start adding up to real money. All right, when can I begin contributing? Um, so this is important because you can't, some companies won't allow you to contribute for up to 90 days. Um, some companies won't let you keep what you have up to after a year. There's a bunch of rules around this. Most tech companies say you can start contributing right away, um, but just double check. Um, vesting period. So vesting period means when you put the money in, how long do you have to stay with the company in order to get it? Um, what are the plan options? What are my fees? Can I do a Roth IRA? Can I do, you know, no load mutual funds? Can I do things that aren't going to cost me money every month? All right. All right. Equity or stock. Um, so shares of a company that are granted to you upon completion of a specific tenure. And that's a really wordy way of saying they give you either shares or promises of shares as a way of incentivizing you to stay with the company. Um, there's restricted stock units. So restricted stock units aren't actually shares of the company until they're actually granted to you. So it's not like they give them to you. You actually have to wait till your vesting period clears. You also have stock options, which are the promise to be able to buy stocks at a certain rate. Um, these are really complicated and we're actually gonna talk about them a little bit later. Um, so just making sure everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me still? 
Okay. All right. Um, and then stock refresh. So stock refresh is basically at the end of every year, do you get more stock options? Do you get more stocks themselves? How does that work for you know your company? And how does that work when you're going for your annual performance and stuff? Um, so when you start getting equity compensation um, offers, you have to ask them what type of equity compensation is it? So that means, do I get actual stocks, actual shares? Do I get options? Do I get RSUs? Is my stock restricted? How much of the stock have you given out? Um, these are really important to understand because if you, a lot of your compensation is in stock and that stock is not valuable, let's say that you joined Enron, uh, those folks had a lot of stock in Enron and then when the company went belly up, it was not so valuable. People lost literally their entire life savings. Um, when you get into restricted stocks and RSUs, what are the restrictions? Some companies have blackout periods. And what that means is here's your grant of RSUs, but you can't sell them for three months, six months, two years. Um, if you're counting on that at the end of the year or the beginning of the year, and then you find out that you have 90 days that you have to hold this money, it basically isn't any good to you. So figure out how long you have to actually hold them in order to be valuable. Do you have a plan to cover taxes? I've seen so many people get burned on this. If you get a $100,000 stock grant and then you sell that stock, you owe Uncle Sam a piece of that money. And if you haven't planned for it, you can get a really nasty tax bill. And it's a huge surprise for a lot of people. Some companies do really well with this and they will sell shares to cover your taxes or they'll take a deduction out of your payroll. There's a ton of stuff that companies can do, but a lot of companies don't do. So it's really important to understand how that works. Um, okay, pre-IPO stock. This is where it gets a little funky. If you go to work for a startup, they can give you what's called pre-IPO stock, which means that this stock is essentially worthless right now, but they're promising you that when it goes into an initial public offering, it will be worth something. Now, that because it's not actually graded by the market, Everything in pre-IPO stock is kind of somebody's guess as to how much it might be worth. So if you're getting pre-IPO stock, understand that it could be worth a lot or it could be worth absolutely nothing. I had friends that went to a certain media company that got offered 1.2 million, 1.8 million in pre-IPO stock that ended up being worth uh, about $100,000 when all was said and done. So you can imagine the nasty pay surprise when you were expecting 1.8 million and got 100,000. That's that's not so good. So um, for IPO stock, ask when their next valuation period is and how much time it is until then. Because if the company's not doing well and the valuation period is a long way off, you don't want to take the chance. I wouldn't want to take the chance that that stock is going to go down. Um, stock options. So we're going to go through an example later on that I think will be super helpful. Um, but what is the percentage of the company you've given in stock? Because that affects how much those stocks are actually going to be worth when you buy them. Um, there's a whole nother presentation that should probably be done on stocks and stock options. And I don't go super deep into it, but I would encourage you to look up the ramifications of how much stock options actually mean to you, depending on how many stocks have actually been allocated. Um, when do I have to exercise my options? Do I have to exercise them? So if I have $10,000 in options and the stock tanks, do I still have to buy them at that higher price? If I do, that might not be a great deal for me. Um, what happens if I co our company gets bought by somebody else? Do my options go away? Do you honor them? Does it become the new stock price for the new company? There's a lot of things to understand about stock options because they're promises of stock in the future. Um, we talked a little bit about vesting. What's the vesting schedule for stocks? Do I have to stay a year, two years, three years? What's the percentage? Some companies have really, uh, let's call it comp company favorable vesting schedules. So for example, one of the major um, tech giant companies has a 5%, 15%, 25%, 25%. And so if you stay a year, you only get 5% of your total grant. Other companies do a 25, 25, 25, 25. So for every year you stay, you get a quarter of your stock. If you're not planning on staying the whole four years or five years, that can be a lot of money that you're leaving on the table. 
Um, what is the policy for stock refresh? What is what does that mean? So like at certain companies, they take um, your stock and they count the appreciation based on like if you got the stock at five dollars and now it's worth fifteen dollars, they multiply all your shares and they're like, well, then we don't need to give you a pay increase because the stock went up so much. Um, so that can be a big bummer. Other companies want to keep competitive with their offers, so they will actually give you more stock just to make sure that you stay. All right. So when I first agreed to do this talk, I um, honestly did not anticipate having to do this much math in the entire year that I, I was planning on being around. But here we go. This is more math than you will probably do in a year. I usually make my husband, who's an accountant, do these for my job offers. But just for you, I went and did all the maths. All right. So we have Aisha. She is a software engineer. She's got five years of experience and she's got three competing offers. Oh, two competing offers. Sorry, I, I was doing three and then it got complicated. I went down to two. Ignore that. It's not there. Uh, so company A offers her a base salary of one hundred and forty thousand and a sign on bonus of twenty five thousand a stock grant of 20,000, an annual bonus of up to 20%, 15 days PTO, a retirement contribution is 50% up to the IRS limit. For most people, the IRS limit will be around 19,500. I think it's gone up a little bit since I last checked. Um, company B, 130, 10,000, 100,000, no annual bonus, question mark on stock bonus refresh. Basically, they don't have a policy. They might do it, they might not. PTO is 10 days and retirement is 50% up to 4% of your salary. So like I said, that's a lot of math, but if you just look at the first year, it looks like it's pretty obvious which offer you would take, right? Obviously it'd be company A because they pay a lot more, but it gets a little more complicated when you look at the total four-year compensation. As you can see, because of the way the stock vests for company B, you almost invert your pay scale. So if you stay to year three, you're actually making $170,000 for longer. If you were to quit after two years, then you'd be about the same. You'd actually make a little bit more with company A. So that's why it's really important to understand how long you're going to stay with a company and how much you actually count your stock as part of your compensation. This is assuming, by the way, that the stock remains the same or goes up because if the stock value goes down, then that can also drop this back down. All right. All right, so now let's compare some potential offers. The reason I say potential is because this depends on your actions. So I'm gonna assume that you're a diligent employee and you're gonna, you're gonna contribute 9% of your salary to your 401k. Um, the first company matches 15%. And then they give you 15 days, which is equivalent to roughly $8,000 um, based on your salary. Company B, you're going to contribute the same 9%, but they only match 50% up to 4%. So that is $2,600. So this starts to nudge your compensation up even more in company A. But that only happens if you contribute to your 401k. If you contribute zero, then this $6,000 goes away. Um, and then on the PTO days, some folks don't count this. I like to look at my time as valuable. And so I like to be paid for it. Uh, PTO days are meaningful to me. Uh, you have to figure out if that's something that's worth it to calculate for your compensation. All right. So once we put that in, it starts to kind of gentle this curve, but you still end up making a lot more years three and four with company B. I know there's a lot of math here. I promise, I promise once you get a hold of the slides, it'll be a lot easier. All right, so now let's get weird. Let's figure out what happens when things out of your control happen. And what do I mean by that? Okay, so let's assume that you were offered company A stock that was $141 a share. By the way, these are definitely not based on real companies with real numbers. Um, so let's assume that company A had $141 share value. After four years, it's now valued at $158 a share. That means that the original stock grant that they gave you of $20,000 is now worth $22,278. So that bumps your four-year stock, sorry, your four-year total compensation up to $664,758. However, company B's stock was originally offered at $536 a share. After four years, it's now valued at $1,869 a share for a total of 347634 
which means your total for your comp is 900,000, I'm sorry, 908,050 dollars. So that is substantially bigger than company A, but that assumes the stock goes up. If it goes down, it could be worth zero. You could have all the stock in the world, and if it's not worth anything, then it doesn't actually matter to your base compensation. The reason I say this, the reason that I think this is super important is because a lot of people predicate a large portion of their pay based on their equity. You can't eat equity. I can't pay my mortgage with the promise of future stocks. I can't pay my mortgage based on, trust me, the stock has always been valuable and will never go down. Maybe that's true. Mostly that's true. In a lot of companies, you can do research to sort of guess that that will continue to be true, but not always. So you can't count on it 100%. So understand your risk tolerance and understand how that affects your total compensation. All right. Let's talk about Kia. She's a program manager. She's got 12 years experience, two competing offers. This slide was correct, unlike the other one. I'm not going to walk you through all of these, but net net, you have a total one year compensation of 195 total one year compensation for company B of 207. I'll give you a minute or two to digest that and then we'll go on. And I know I'm talking really fast and throwing a lot of stuff at you, but um, there's, there's so much density in this presentation. I wanna make sure we get through it and then hopefully have time for questions after. All right, so same thing here. As you can see, you start to invert that growth, growth curve based on how long it takes your stock to vest. Now, there's not as much difference. So depending on like work-life balance and vacation, maybe it's worth it to you. Um, but here's some hidden factors that you may not see. So company A looks like it's lower in total compensation because they give you stock options. Stock options mean you have to pay money to get money. This particular company will actually give you 5% of your base salary. And then you can buy literally your entire salary's worth of their stock options. They don't have a cap on it. But again, this is hoping that the stock goes up. If the stock goes down, then you have literally spent money and gotten nothing in return. So that's why it's really hard to compare these offers. You have to understand their risk th profile. So let's take company A. They're the ones that gave you the stock options. Um, let's assume that they give me my 5%. Um, so that's roughly 27 shares. Um, strike price means what the stock is selling for the day that I get granted the option. So. I exercise that a year later at 480, the stock's gone up, yay me, I make $12,960. Or let's say I feel a little more risky with company A. I decide to kick in an additional $10,000 of my own money and I get another 28 shares. So same strike price, same exercise price. Now I have a profit of $16,400. So you can see that that pushes my total compensation up by quite a bit. Um, but this is only if the stock goes up. If the stock goes down, I have literally just given them $10,000 and gotten basically nothing back. Now, I will get some of that returned if the stock doesn't go so low that it's worthless, but it will be somewhere between $10,000 and zero. So you can see with that, that when you compare company A and company B in the first year, if you do the middle option, if you give more of your money to the stock options and they go up, this is where that branching logic comes in, then you're actually coming out of head. If those stock options go down, you could actually fall below this base pay rate. That means that uh, this purple chunk, this guaranteed chunk becomes no longer guaranteed because you're choosing to give money into a stock option plan. All right. So that's a bunch of stuff thrown at you. There's a bunch of offers. Now let's talk about once you have your offer, how do you actually negotiate and get what you're worth? Uh, do your research, figure out how many years of experience you have. And I think this is so important, especially when I speak to groups of women, uh, we tend to say, okay, well, the job says I need to have 10 years of experience as a, as a C-sharp programmer. And well, I mean, I only have nine and a half years experience as a Java programmer. Okay, maybe you don't have exactly 10 years as a C-sharp programmer, but Java, you're close enough. You have been programming for 10 years. Java is going to get you at least halfway there. Don't discount that as experience. If it doesn't meet exactly, don't just throw it away. Um, lean on your network. One of the most important things that I've learned is to be able to call people in other companies. Um, when I was negotiating for one of my jobs recently, I called somebody that worked in the company. I said, hey, this is the offer they gave me. Is that pretty standard from what you've seen? And they were able to connect me with other people in that company who had the same job. 
And most of them were really um, forthcoming and really um, kind enough to kind of walk me through those offers. I really believe, especially as women and especially as minorities, we need to work together to share salary information because it's the only way to uncover pay inequities. The only way that we actually start moving the needle on this stuff. Um, Sites like Glassdoor, Levels.fyi, and LinkedIn are really good sources of data, but you'll find as you get towards the higher end of the pay scale, their veracity starts to break down. And anybody who does data science for a living can tell you that that's because there are fewer people in that bucket, so the data becomes a little wonky. But just understand that for most folks, probably in the like junior to mid-level, they're great. Once you go above senior, it starts to get a little less reliable. All right, remember Aisha? She's back. All right. So we're going to take her two offers. She's got company A. Oops, sorry. That was whew. 170,000 is her total comp. So she goes out to levels.fyi and she looks up the type of engineer that she's going to be. So I put back end in full stack um, because there wasn't a lot of either. So I wanted to kind of get a cross section. So you'll see that 170 is actually pretty OK ish. It's not great but it's right in the middle of a 61 or a 62 at a certain company. Anyone who's worked at that company probably looks at this and goes, oh, I know which company this is. If you don't, just Google level 61 tech and it'll pop up. Um, so she wants to negotiate. When she gets her offer, she wants to be pushing to be a 62 if she can, because this is the thing I wish I would have known when I went to tech. I got such a significant raise coming out of government that I was like, I don't care what level I am. It's totally fine. Um, it totally does matter. I got put in as a PM2 with 10 years of experience. Um, everyone else at my level had less than three years of experience, and it actually drastically affected my total pay and my promotion cadence. It really, really messed me up for a long time. I ended up getting paid less for several years just because I didn't ask this question. Ask what level it is. Ask what the pay bands are. In the state of California and Washington, they're required by law to give you a pay range. So please ask for the pay range. Um, next one. All right. So now you figured out kind of what your compensation is and if it's fair or not, but you really want to see if you can get the most possible money out of this company that you can because gosh darn it, you're worth it. Um, so the rule is always negotiate, except when you shouldn't. And I know that's really confusing. But let's figure out when you should and shouldn't negotiate. Oh, come on, slides. Don't fail me now. Sorry. Tech problems. All right. So you negotiate when you have a written offer. Um, I've talked to a lot of my friends in HR who see so many candidates below it by starting before they've even done the interview and saying, well, I need to make one million dollars or don't even bother with me. Most of the time, they're not going to bother with you because you haven't actually demonstrated your value. Don't negotiate until they've given you an offer because you are not then in a more powerful position to start moving that compensation package up or down. Um, they are probably going to give you their middle best offer most of the time. And that way you can figure out if their pay range is anywhere close. If you're making 100,000 and they offer you 50, you guys probably are never going to actually meet where it is acceptable for you. It's just not going to happen. If they give you an offer that's okay-ish, but has room, like if they could give you just 10% more, then you can figure out if it's worth negotiating. Um, figure out if you can provide more value. Um, here's something that a lot of folks don't always see. Um, being a URM in and of itself provides value because when you're on an engineering team, when you're on a product team, having non-homogenized views builds better products. By definition of the fact that you are a URM, you are providing value. Your experience matters. Um, figure out how you're a unique candidate. Um, one of my sort of superpowers is that I, because I run a conference, I know a lot of people. So that sounds silly, right? Okay, so she knows a lot of people. Well, that means that when I run into a problem and I need to call somebody at a company, I probably know somebody there. If we need to form a partnership, I, I don't have to go through the, you know, the sales calls and the, 17 people to get there, I can just pick up the phone because I probably already know somebody. Figure out what your superpowers are and be able to articulate those to future employers. All right. S statistically and historically, women don't negotiate their pay. Um, I've been told that it's better to negotiate as if, you know, it's your best friend or a close relative. 
I actually negotiate uh, on behalf of women everywhere. I have negotiated every single offer um, in the last probably 10 years. Once I read that women don't negotiate, now it's like this weird pride thing with me where I'm like, well, I'm not going to be one of the women who don't negotiate. I'm totally negotiating. Um, my most recent uh, job, they came in actually really at the top end of their salary band. And I knew it was a great offer and it was way more than I was making. Um, and I still negotiated because I thought I'm not going to be one of those women who doesn't ask for more money. So uh, I ended up, I think, getting I was like it's two thousand dollars more or something ridiculous. But I still asked and I still, you know, it was still something that they were able to do. Um, know what your fold line is. And what do I mean by that? Um, I had a job offer with a company that I loved. I thought I would be so good at it. I loved the team. The job was great, but they were offering me $10,000 less than what I was making at my current job. And I just couldn't do it. And I knew that. And so I walked away. Um, I just said, you know, thanks, thanks, but I can't do this. So I, uh, they called me back uh, after two weeks and said, okay, just kidding. We're going to raise it and pay you $10,000 more than what you're actually making at your current job. If I had taken that job at that pay, I would have been miserable because I would have felt undervalued. Don't go into a job thinking that, you know, oh, it's OK that they're not paying me what I'm worth because it will gnaw at you and you will be unhappy. Um, if you can't get them on salaries, ask for things like vacation days, flexible work schedule, commuter benefits. See if there's any way they can make up that difference in a way that's meaningful to you. All right. Key takeaways. And I know we've covered an awful lot. Um, understand different comp structures, figure out your risk and reward schedule, do your research on years of experience, your pay levels, um, et cetera. Always, always negotiate, but wait till you have a written offer to do so. Um, so here's the resources. Uh, I just, just set up my, my website. It's got like two things on it, but people keep asking me for my slides and I always send them to like Dropbox and Drive and wherever my internet host is of the day. So I've just put them all on this. Uh, we laugh because I just started a job in Internet of Things. So this is the Internet of Tracy. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that is pretty much it. I actually just realized that I am not in the stage where I can see your questions. So give me like two seconds and I will pop over there and I will be around for questions for the next 10 minutes or so. Yeah, I can read them. Okay, I'm here. Oh, so yeah. I'll read them to you. Yep. All um, right. So, so the first question we got, um, I'm just going to read them verbatim because every time we try to change uh, pronouns and stuff, it, it gets really weird. So it's not my question, but <laughs> you'll hear I. Um, question. Okay. A a lot of yes. people I know are breaking into InfoSec and trying to get their first job, may or may not have yeah. a degree, or they work jobs yeah. that yeah. don't offer stock or six for your salary. So that's the premise. Um, yeah. Do you have recommendations for how to make a large jump from a five-figure salary to something paying in the mid 100s with stock and additional benefits? Yes, but you may not like this answer. So I, too, did not have a degree when I came into InfoSec. Um, and quite frankly, if I'm being honest, my degree now is not really worth the paper it's written on. Um, but I've, look, they were involved in a lawsuit. It's a whole long thing. You can look it up. It's fine. Um, so what I did is I put a five year plan in and I knew that I was doing server admin at first. It was my fir I was doing patches. It was like the lowest level infosec job that I could get. The pay was terrible. The hours were terrible. The manager was terrible. But I spent a lot of time and I figured out a certification path. And for me, that worked. I got A plus and net plus and security plus. And every year or two years, I would go and interview for a job that was wildly beyond my qualifications. And even if I didn't get it, I started to learn what questions they were asking. Um, the cool thing now is you can go on sites like Blind, you can go on stock sites like Levels, you can go on Glassdoor or Leak Code. There's a bunch of other ones. And you can start seeing what interview questions they're asking and start preparing yourself. So a lot of this information is much more democratized than it was when I was coming up. And I know I sound like Methuselah, but um, that's that's how I would do it if I were trying to make that significant jump. Don't get you're much more likely to get more pay, unfortunately, if you go to a new company. And that, that's a terrible thing. And I wish that wasn't the state of our industry. But that is unfortunately the state of our industry today. OK, yes, yes, it is. All right, cool. So the next question is um, looks pay, directly gaps, at you. <laughs> pay gaps between men and women, unfortunately, exist. But for black yeah. women or women of color specifically, there's even more of a gap. 
Aside yes. from all the awesome advice you gave, what else could black women or women of color do to negotiate for a salary that at least meets the minimum that their white female counterparts make? So that's a great question. And I will just be completely honest and say that not being a person of color, I feel like I don't have a ton of great experience to offer. Um, for me, I think it is in the power of networking and asking around. And unfortunately for me, it's, as a white woman, I know that I am making less than my male counterparts. It's not fair and it's not right. And I fight against it every single day. Um, I haven't found a way to make that go away. Um, I will say joining things like Blacks and Cyber, joining um, things like, and I hate to sound like a shill, but DefendCon where we have career villages and we have resume workshops and being able to really leverage your network, I think for all URMs is incredibly important. I think it is the number one thing we can do to dismantle the pay gap. Like, I just wanted to comment just because I've done <laughs> also negotiations. Um, ask your white male colleagues who are doing the exact same job you are doing with the exact same credentials or as close as you can get. And then be prepared for your jaw to drop. But that gives you a sense of what they're earning. So I think you're in an even better position to negotiate when you know what what people are paying, right? Don't be afraid to ask them. I I'm always shocked at how people just tell you, like if if they're if they know you that they will tell you they want to they want to help you. They're your ally. Like take advantage of it. Um, so and, I think it's one of those knowledge like is power. Blind. Yeah, and sites like Blind can actually give you a really good idea um, for total compensation as well. Um, but also understand that, especially as women and as minorities, we are not always. I have not always been in a position where I could hold out to the last cent because. You know, I had bills to pay and I had to make a paycheck even if I knew it wasn't a fair paycheck. And I don't love that. And I think we should continue fighting every day to make it not like that. But I do also respect and understand that because of my privilege, I have not had to um, walk those shoes. I don't necessarily have that experience. Totally. Um, all right, so the next question is, can you speak to how much these numbers might change if someone doesn't live in a tech hub can they have similar expectations for compensation? Oh, uh, you've chosen an interesting year to ask that question. <laughs> um, I'll give you my pre-COVID answer and my post-COVID answer. Pre-COVID, <laughs> I would say yes, you would definitely have a significant decrease in compensation. Um, cost of living is lower, uh, you know, prices is lower, labor market is lower. I have found that unless you're in a tech hub, unfortunately, you're just not going to see those salaries. But I will also say that having lived in Alabama, my house there was 230,000 for a four bedroom house. And uh, it is definitely not that in Seattle. Um, so yes, I get paid way more than I did in Alabama, but I also spend an awful lot more. Post COVID, I think we're gonna start to see an inversion in the labor market as people realize that yes, we can do remote work because we are. Um, and as talent starts to flee hubs like the Bay Area and Seattle and Austin, I think you're going to see pay level. I think you're going to see those compensations start to level out because if I can get a software engineer in Tulsa to do the job for half the pay, then why wouldn't I as a business? Does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm trying to scroll through. So hopefully if the person didn't like the answer, they'll, they'll ask a new one. Um, <laughs> so how do you approach negotiating telecommuting for a position? Ah, okay. Yeah, so I was only honestly my, I, again, I feel like I'm like 700 years old. So um, I think I finally got to a place where, uh, so, Full disclosure, with the last company I was with, uh, they were in Seattle. I actually live outside of Seattle. It's about an hour and a half commute. And they approached, the recruiter approached me and I said, look, I said, I don't do jobs in Seattle. Like full stop, nope, not happening. She's like, well, just talk to the team and eh, you know, everything's negotiable. And so I started my very first talk with the hiring manager and said, I'm not driving to Seattle. I'll come in two days a week, take it or leave it. Um, I can do that because I'm at a level in my career where I'm very fortunate to have different job offers. Not everyone has that option. Oh dear, it looks like we just lost our speaker. I'm sorry, that was my mistake. Um, I was attempting to hide the speaker's desktop. Okay. Uh, 
Hang tight, everybody, while we try to get Tracy back. And it looks like there's a, a lot of great conversations going on in chat while we kind of hang tight for a minute. Um, just going to scroll through and make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, there's some, yeah, there's some really great questions. Hopefully we can get Tracy back because I don't feel like I'm the expert uh, <laughs> to answer these. Um, but keep chatting amongst yourselves. You are back. Yay. Okay. We were, we were talking about how to negotiate uh, telecommuting. So maybe you can start from there again. Okay. Hold on. Okay, Let me on. find. Let me find. Find. Okay. So we can't hear you. If you can hear Great. me. Oh. Okay, no, sorry. I had that old link was open in the background and oh, so no. I could hear you, but you couldn't hear me. And then it was this crazy echo situation happening. Sorry, I'm back. Um, what was our last question? I've totally- It's about like, it telecommuting. Off. How to negotiate telecommuting, telecommuting yes. which you have experience um, with. I do actually uh, this, uh, well, I mean, don't all of us now with COVID, but um, so I, my answer is not great in that I understand that because um, I've just been around a while and I, I I've been very fortunate in job offers. I was able to say, take it or leave it. But if you don't have that flexibility, I would say look for companies that are intrinsically remote friendly. Um, companies like Twitter, for example, have gone 100% remote option if you are if you want to. Um, other companies have a culture of butts and seats. Um, understand that before you go in. Um, don't think you're gonna change the company culture um, because best case scenario, you negotiate remote and you get shut out of a culture that is focused on being butts and seats and it's harder to get promoted and it's harder to inter interject with the team. Um, so I guess that's the best answer. Uh, the next question is kind of interesting. And so the, the question is, how do you breach the negotiation conversation? So I, I'm not sure I understand it completely, but maybe that means something to you. I think it's like, how do you get going with the negotiations? Yeah, I think how do you take it and then say, thanks, but no thanks, I want more money. Okay. I think that's what that, I think that's what, that's the question I'm going to answer. If it's not, then okay, let's me. go for it. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll check the chat in case that's not the, the okay. right answer. Um, so right I would question. say, assuming you have a written offer in hand, um, actually let's go back. Let's go back before that. So they're going to ask you, what do you want to get paid? And I hope that you're going to say, tell me what the salary range is for this position and then figure out based on your skills and experience where you land in that range. Let them name a number first if you can. I am legitimately awful at this, but do let them name a number first because you never know um, what they're actually able to pay you unless you let them name an offer first. Um, when you get the offer, if it's not what you expected or it doesn't work for you, or if you're just trying to ask and see if they have any more room. Um, I usually like to say, you know, I'm start off with the reasons you want the job. I am so excited to come work for X company. I, I think my skills are a really good match. I really think I can provide a lot of value to this team. I want to be happy here long term. And in order to do that, I just feel like the compensation isn't quite where it needs to be to make this a viable offer for me. So never say you're not paying me enough money or, hey, this offer sucks or any of those things. Um, Try to frame it in a positive. Frame it as I'm bringing your company value. I want to make sure that you know we're both happy at the end of the day because a happy employee is a productive employee. Is that kind of in the realm? Yeah. Or... Okay. Well, I, I'm not getting any. Um... Oh, okay. So then there was sort of a follow up, which is interesting. What do you say when a company asks for salary requirements on an application or phone screen? Huh. Um... I usually put something crazy because um, they're usually usually the form will ask you for a number, an integer number. So I'll put something crazy like one to five dollars. 
Um, and then when the uh, recruiter is like one to five dollars, that's obscene. I will remind them that a ask, asking me to provide my at least the state of Washington and California asking me to provide salary history is no longer legal. Um, and also I will say something like, well, I really, you know, I really want to take this job. I understand that it's a unique position and my experience speaks for itself, but I know that this position will be unique and I'm sure that you're going to pay according to the skill set that you're looking for. Something that lets them know, hey, I understand why you're asking this question, but no, I'm not going to give you my salary required or my salary requirements or my salary history. Yeah, I I won't do it either. So I'm down with that answer. <laughs> um, how do you negotiate when making a pivot or a career change? I.e., you have significant work experience, but not in cyber. Are you starting from scratch? Oh, this is a hard one. Um... There's not a good answer for this. Um, you're not starting from scratch. You definitely bring life skills and um, experience to the table. However, if you are trying to make a career change, understand that you may have to go back to go forwards. Um, I did this a little bit um, when I came into tech. Um, I made significantly more, but I didn't make as much as somebody who had been doing tech for a long time. Part of it, to be quite honest, my own ignorance and part of it because I was literally entering a new field that for very little resemblance to my previous field. Um, figure out if this job is going to get you to the salary you wanna be in five years. And what I mean by that is, is this just a placeholder job? If it is, then it's probably not worth taking a pay cut. Is this a job that in a year you can say, okay, now I have red team experience or blue team experience, and then I can go get a SOC analyst two position or three that's gonna get me closer to my actual to pay target. Uh, I know that's kind of a fuzzy answer, but it, it really does depend on kind of what your five five year plan is. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I think it's smart to look out. I don't think a lot of us plan that far out in advance. I mean, I know I don't, I, but I like I it. I have a good it's, game. Honestly, I don't plan like more than 20 minutes in, into my future. Or I have plans and then they just all fall apart. So. They just fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this is an interesting question. Um, any advice for negotiating with big companies, big all in caps? They usually feel like here's your offer, take it or leave it, or that. Or, for example, yeah. flex work isn't a policy they can control. So, like with a big company, like they have all the policies and all the things, and take it or leave it. Yeah. Like, what do you do? So, I will say it's much easier to negotiate with smaller companies. Um, however, um, a certain tech company that rhymes with schmoogle. Um, when we were in salary negotiations, they said, look, our, our pay is equity heavy. That's just how it is. That's, you know, it's beyond my, my control. You know, I, I am, you know, controlled by the great overlords that run the company. And that's, you know, that's just the way it is. I said, well, thank you very much, but that's just not going to work for me. Um, that was my fold line. So you have to know, is it worth it to get that name on your resume? Because that is worth something. Being able to say you worked at you know XYZ big company is worth something. How much is that worth to you? Are you starting out in your career? Are you senior in your career? I'm in a point now where you know if God himself offered me a job, I'd be like, well, let's talk terms. You know, because I I just I'm at a point where I'm really picky about the jobs I, I take and I want us both to be happy. I like it. <laughs> and um, so the last question before we get kicked off the stage is at what stage of the hiring process are the HR questions that you discussed in the beginning appropriate to ask? They're not necessarily negotiating. Um, and now I don't remember um, what questions were at the beginning. So oh, hopefully you do. Questions about like stock, stock equity, RSUs versus stock options, vesting, all that. Um, I will say the answer is twofold. One, um, do as much research as you can on your own because you don't want to be the person that pesters the HR rep to death and then they hate you because um, that that's just never that's no good for anyone. Most of this stuff you can find um, online. You can find either on the company's website or on things like levels.fyi. Um, if you go to levels.fyi, you can compare, say, Microsoft and Amazon and you can see um, like their vesting schedule and um, you can look at different offers and see how much their bonus is and uh, you can Google a lot of this for yourself. If you absolutely cannot find the answer, then the appropriate time to ask it is um, right after they give you the written offer. Um, basically, until you have a piece of paper in your hand, you have no negotiating credentials whatsoever. So I would recommend taking the offer, 
asking questions back and forth and then doing a total comp analysis for yourself. That, those graphs that I made, you can go and make on levels.fyi and you can compare offers yourself and that'll give you kind of an uh, overview of how much you're actually gonna make in four years. Awesome, well, thanks so much. I, have, I thought this was a great talk and hopefully everybody else did. I've shared Tracy's URL where you can get the slides. I did go boop over and make sure that it, that worked and it does. Okay. Uh, I've also <laughs> shared a survey uh, for the talk. So please fill out the survey. Thanks everybody, stay tuned for the next talk.